Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here, and thanks for the fresh air and the blue sky. This is a real treat for me since I live in Jakarta, and sometimes finding blue sky is, uh, is a bit of a problem there at times. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the project that we worked on and as a case study. I know today there's been a great discussion, um, a very diverse discussion, about um, our oceans and the role that they play in our lives, um, but we haven't touched much on um, the human toll um, that's taken that sometimes we might not know about in terms of the, um, the fishermen who are catching the seafood that we eat every day. And so in um, 2014, my colleague Robin McDowell and I, she was in Burma and I was in Jakarta, we um, decided that we wanted to look at an issue that we knew was a problem. Everyone knew it was an open secret, really, um, for many years. We had heard stories that um, fishermen from Southeast Asia um, were being trafficked onto ships and taken to faraway places where they were forced to work for years at a time. But no one had been able to actually um, find captive you know, men or slaves in this case. Um, and no one had actually traced their catch back to um, the West, or in our case, we were looking specifically at the US. So in 2014, we worked for about a year, and we got um, word, we started hearing rumblings or whispers about this island in the Air Force Sea, which is the far eastern part of Indonesia, um, just above Australia and near Papua New Guinea. And we uh, journeyed to this Little Island it takes a couple of days to get there, really, um, by boat and by air. Um, for parts of the year, it's completely inaccessible because the waves are so large. And um, there were no telephones there. So a, a perfect place if you wanted to have a slave island. Um, and so you can see here, there's a, on one side, this is kind of the village area here. And on this side is uh, where the seafood uh, company was set up. It was an Indonesian Thai joint venture, and that airstrip was abandoned and not in use. So not a lot there, kind of middle of nowhere. Um, when uh, we got there, actually Robin McDowell went, she found a whole bunch of Burmese men, um, mostly, mostly Burmese, some Cambodian, some Laotian, and some Thai. And um, she couldn't communicate with them, so she brought in our um, Myanmar reporter, Esther Tucson. And they started um, talking to these guys, and they soon realized that they were in a desperate situation. Most of them, all of them actually, had been trafficked from Thailand. Um, some of them years ago. Um, some of them had been there for a couple of decades, actually. And um, they were trapped. And they couldn't get off the island. And there was no way to leave. There was no way to get home. They were being um, beaten. Uh, they were sometimes they had seen colleagues killed. Um, they were forced to work for little or absolutely no money in a lot of cases. Um, you know, they were given very little to eat, dirty water. I mean, you name it. It was a really dire situation. It was very desperate. Um, and you know, they were catching large amounts of fish. And we watched this fish being loaded onto a refrigerated cargo ship that was a, a Thai ship. And you know, the men were um, literally running after Robin and Esther, and they were sticking little pieces of paper in their hands, and they were saying, look, please, when you get back to Burma, please find my mother, tell her I'm alive, I haven't spoken to her in five, I haven't spoken to her in 10 years, they don't know we're alive, they don't know where we are, please help us. Um, and so this man, um, this was very common, he was showing us uh, his Siemens book, a copy of his Siemens book. And in it, uh, that's his picture, but nothing else is real. It's not his name, it's not his address, it's not his birth date. It all belongs to a Thai man that he does not know. Um, and this was common. This was how they did it. They basically gave these men fake documents. And so in Indonesia, no one could speak Thai or Burmese, and so no one knew the nationality, the, real, the true nationality of these men. And because they were undocumented and illegal, they were all too afraid to go anywhere and ask for help. And you know, most of the officials that were there 
would have rounded them up anyway and taken them back to the boat because they were being paid off to do so. Um, so then we found this graveyard. And there were approximately 70 graves here on a beach. And again, you see the names are all Thai names. These are all addresses and, and everything from the Siemens book. So even in death, these men were not given the dignity of being buried under their own names. And their families still, to this day, have no idea where they are. Um, then we, uh, we found probably the most alarming thing, and that was um, men locked in a cage. And this was not a jail that was being run by um, the government or you know, immigration. This was a company jail. And these men that were in this jail or in this cell were put there for simply for asking to go home, saying that they didn't want to work anymore. This man in particular was injured, and he, he simply just couldn't work anymore. And so they tossed him in this cell with several other men. And this was a common thing that was happening. Um, so at this point, we had found um, captive, literally, slaves at this point. Um, but we still needed to track their catch back to American uh, businesses and dinner tables because we knew that in, in, able, in order to get the most impact out of this story and to really make people understand in the West that this is going on and that this is a problem, we needed to name names. We needed to go after the companies that were buying this fish and call them out on it. And so... Um, we saw that this fish was being loaded onto this Thai uh, reefer called the Silver Sea Line, and um, then we followed it. We used satellites, and um, we followed it all the way from Benjina, and we watched it for two weeks as it headed up to Samutsukhan, just outside of Bangkok. And then Robin flew there from uh, Myanmar, and I flew there from Jakarta, and for four nights, we kind of hid out in the back of um, little Toyota pickup trucks with tented windows with our legs scrunched up for sometimes 10 hours. And we, over the course of four nights, followed these um, deliveries as they were being made to various companies in Thailand. So we went to um, different processors and different um, wholesalers there and even to the major market um, and at that point, we had, we had names that we could connect. And so um, we started to look at U.S. customs data. And at that point, um, our colleague Martha Mendoza in the U.S. started to kind of help us um, stitch this together to the U.S. And we started finding a lot of familiar brands, cat food brands, um, some of the biggest companies in the country, in grocery stores, were selling this fish. Um, it was in their supply chains. And so we confronted them about that, and um, they were clearly, uh, I wouldn't say that they were completely unaware or totally surprised, but they were not happy um, that we were calling them out, that's for sure. Um, the U.S. Uh, basically started looking at its laws, and they found that there was an old law on the books basically that allowed um, anything coming into the U.S., even if it was, even if it was from slavery, um, if there was a consumptive demand, it was still allowed to pass through. So um, Obama was still in office at that point, and uh, his administration worked on this, and, and they were able to get this loophole closed. And, um, and then the story was published, and um, there was a major response and Indonesia, um, in particular, the Indonesian fishing minister, um, Ibu Susi, was um, very upset to learn that this was happening um, in Indonesia under her watch. She had just come in, was, was new, only had been in a few months at the job. And so she sent a task force um, to Benjina to see if what we were saying was true, because it was kind of almost too hard to believe. And, it was true, and so she basically um, ordered right then and there that these men, there were hundreds of them, that they be evacuated. And so um, word started to spread on the island that they were going home. And at that point, um, men started running uh, because they didn't want to be left behind. 
They were coming from the jungles. They were coming from the hills. They were running to their boats and grabbing whatever meager belongings they had there and stuffing them into plastic bags. It was pouring rain, um, but they continued to flood to the boats um, so that they would not be stuck there. And they were, just, they were just completely overjoyed that they were finally getting to go home. In this picture, um, they were asked, who here wants to go home? And you can see overwhelmingly that they all um, wanted to go. And um, the Indonesian government um, continued scouring the islands, and this was in the Maluku's, um, you know, for the, the rest of the year, really, and um, continued to find more and more men. And again, most of these men were Burmese, and you can see some of them, look at how young, you know, these are the men who are catching the seafood that you're, that you're eating, and very few people think about that, but, you know, the, these are the people that are giving it, that are, that are doing the work that's giving you the fish. Um, Again, we had you know, a number of repatriations, and Australia was actually very helpful in that, it provided um, a lot of funding to the IOM to assist with that. And I followed um, this man home to Burma. He had been in Indonesia for 22 years and had not had any contact with his family. And you can see you know, him reigniting first with his sister and then with his mother. And um, as a result of our reporting, um, 2,000, more than 2,000 men were freed and repatriated. Um, and um, I would like to say that this problem has been solved and that it doesn't exist anymore, but it's still very much a problem. And um, we see it happening all the time. So we're still working on this as well. Thank you so much.